one with a conventional medicine background would associate with as part, uh, a required part of the monograph evaluation. So, uh, in terms of therapeutic use, uh, within the PRC, uh, the idea is, um, uh, in terms of the um, adequacy uh, of the data, then there would be uh, uh, an approval recommendation to the board of the, the directors. And, but there are situations where there's insufficient clinical data, and then we would recommend additional evidence. Now, so it goes back to the sponsor. So how could that look like, and how is that likely to look like in terms of our vision? Um, the first part is this drug discovery uh, part. In other words, uh, the toxicology, historical clinical use, and provings. So if a proving is of high quality and will provide uh, a good uh, and rich symptom picture that's emerged from the proving, uh, then there could be sufficient weight and validity of the data to justify uh, a recommendation of approval of this monograph to the board. And we have seen it, this now with a number of high quality provings that have been conducted in line with the new guidelines um, uh, over the last uh, three, four years that they, on the basis of a high quality provings, there is a monograph approval recommendations and monographs have been approved. But of course there's this other track where there's insufficient weight or validity of the data and additional data is required. And this is where the clinical data part comes in. And we've worked very long and hard within our working group on the clinical case part. And personally, uh, I have worked uh, for the past eight or nine years on developing standards for reporting uh, guidelines of clinical case reports. And in India I've given seminars, but in many other countries uh, uh, of the world, I'm actually giving seminars on how to improve the quality of clinical case reports because we feel in homeopathy that, also historically speaking, clinical case material has been a very important component of the clinical evidence. The second level is observational studies. Um, and there, again, we see a very big role for homeopathy because as someone like Lex Rutten in the Netherlands he has adopted and published on new uh, methods that can be applied, uh, borrowing the methods from Bayesian statistics uh, and likelihood ratios calculations that we can get an indication from observational data what symptoms are predictive of successful outcome and what symptoms, as we see in homeopathic practice, so I'm talking about individualized symptoms, are less predictive. And so there's a real revolution taking place in the last decade in terms of our methodologies, how we can improve our methods uh, in identifying the symptoms that are predictive and the symptoms are not predictive. And the third pillar or component is experimental trials, randomized controlled trials. But as we will explain is that we foresee that within the homeopathic framework, this is a less dominant component compared to conventional medicine. So again, then this could lead uh, as additional data to a uh, monograph approval recommendation or if there is if an insufficient weight uh, to a monograph disapproval. So for instance, if we see now a scenario that uh, a sponsor conducts approving and the approving is deemed to be of insufficient quality for monograph approval. Um, uh, so there's two possibilities. It is possible that, that the proving method, the, the proving was simply not conducted in accordance with rigorous uh, methodology. So that's one option. The other option is that it was the, the proving, the methodology was in line with the proving guideline, but simply the granularity of the outcome of the proving, the symptoms that were revealed, were simply not rich enough for a homeopath to say, well, I can use this proving as a basis for prescribing this medicine on an individualized basis. So uh, for both strategy, uh, we have different pathways. Obviously, if you have done a poor quality proving, the, the most obvious recommendation is, uh, well, do a high quality or a proper, uh, repeat your proving, but do it better. Uh, or another option is that you say, well, you can't uh, keep this proving as it is, but 
you need to give us more data. And that could, for instance, be observational data. That could be a number of clinical cases, that could be a case series, or that could be an observational study. The other pathway is that if there is insufficient outcome, uh, uh, but a low, based on a good quality proving, then uh, you would say, well, maybe uh, repeat your proving in a different population. Maybe the, the study base that you had in your first proving was not, didn't give you a rich enough perspective, so repeat your proving in another population. Uh, or the same, you could add case reports and add observational data. So this is a much more rich way of looking at clinical data. So it's not a very rigid way, so we have to do this or that. It's say, okay, how can you develop sufficient clinical data to get a rich enough symptom picture from a homeopathic perspective to justify monograph approval? Um, okay, to summarize, uh, allopathic medicines and homeopathic medicines have different needs in terms of their pre-market evaluation. Therefore, drug discovery and clinical verification approaches will be different. And what we are now seeing and what we are sharing with you is the results of our work and we talk about a matrix of evidence requirements. And those of you who know me uh, know that for the past 15 to 20 years in many of my presentations I often talk about a mosaic of evidence. Uh, my, my argument is that we shouldn't look at evidence as a, in a reductionist way like a single method should lead to a result. Uh, I'm talking about looking at what are the particular objectives that you have? And how can you build up a mosaic of evidence or a matrix of evidence uh, that supports your objectives? And we are now within the HPUS, I feel, in, 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 in a phase where we can really lay down uh, um, a framework for that in terms of monograph approval. And again, I think additional research and harmonization of the monograph process across pharmacopoeias would be greatly beneficial. And just listening to what's happening today, I feel some common strands are emerging. So I really look forward to our discussion uh, this afternoon, in particular, when we have much more time for discussion on how we can really find the common ground. I thank you very much for your presentation, for your attention. Yes, thank you for this very, very interesting and inspiring um, talk. Um, we now just move on because discussion on these topics will happen this afternoon. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Katosh, who is an advisor for the Ayush Ministry. Um, he, his origin is Ayurveda, as I understood. And he will talk to us about regulatory possibilities and challenges in India, paths for regulation of homeopathic medicinal projects. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am not a homeopathy expert, but for being as a government servant in the ministry, I am looking after a drugs quality control, and I also sit with my homeopathy colleagues in the ministry, and I also get some representations, some notifications from the industry. So from that only I have learned what homeopathy is all about. So my presentation uh, is mainly related to the issues related to homeopathy drugs. Now, what I have listened yesterday from some of the experts that homeopathy practice is a global phenomenon, more so in 86 countries and it is increasing. Around 500 to 600 million people annually consume homeopathic medicines and the growth, growth about the use of homeopathy that is very good, 26.3%. Regulatory framework and requirements for quality control and market authorization and registration of the homeopathic medicines differs from country to country. Uh, and this is a challenge. Varying level of trust and confidence among consumers. Medical fraternity, regulators, accept homeopathy practitioners. Only homeopathic practitioners, they say that, okay, 
our medicines are working, they are of quality, they are efficacious. But the consumers, the regulators, the medical fraternity, they have different level of trust and confidence about the homeopathic medicines. Now, from the regulatory perspective, the first prerequisite for regulation is to have standards. You will check the things when you have the standards. What the regulator will do? So some standards have to be in place, whether the standards of the raw materials, standards of the intermediaries, standards of the process, standards of the finished products, standards of the shelf life. So that has to be in place. And after that, then there are legal provisions. So those standards are put in the legal provisions, whether in the form of the act or in the form of regulations or rules, then for the manufacturer, when he goes to the regulator with an application, with a proposal that, okay, I want to manufacture this drug or I want to market this drug, then he submits a dossier along with the documentation, the testing, analysis reports. Then either the license is granted or the registration is done or the market authorization is done. And if the product or the manufacturer fail to fail to comply with the standards, then he could be declared as a defaulter. Some legal action can be taken against him, against the product or against the manufacturer. So uh, this is the regulatory perspective. Now, for the building blocks for the drug regulation, I think uh, my previous speaker, we rightly told that these are the three main things, the safety, efficacy, and quality. But safety and efficacy, both are subsumed under quality. Quality, when you say quality product, it means that is safe and that is effective. So quality itself is a complete term. So the quality product. We cannot say it is good quality, bad quality, or high quality. Quality is quality. Quality is a optimal, optimal thing. Then the important thing is to, def to define substandard drug, spurious drug, misbranded drug, and adulterated drug. This we have done in our act, drugs and cosmetic act for Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani, and even for the chemical drugs, allopathic drugs. But I think it is not so far for the homeopathic drugs. Then what are the analysis method, testing methods for, the, for checking the quality of the drugs? And then to fix the defaulter. These are the building blocks for the drug regulation, and these are equally applicable to homeopathic drugs. Now, if you see the regulatory framework in India, the government of India has provided inclusive support to homeopathy, homeopathy drugs, inclusive support. Means all the systems are at par. Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani, homeopathy, Swaripa, yoga, naturopathy, even drugs. And I think uh, what uh, in the previous session, uh, our chairman, Dr. Honda, he told that we have pluralistic system of health. Okay. And medical pluralism, I think it is a bliss for India. But in spite of that, we have the highest disease burden. We have so many systems, but even then, 21% of the disease burden, global disease burden, it contributed from India, 21%. Now, in spite of having all these things, inclusive support to the, uh, all the systems, including homeopathy, but we have exclusive provisions in the Act for homeopathy. We have exclusive provisions exclusive provisions, and these provisions are a bit stackered, uh, scattered in the Act. They are not at one place. S definition of homeopathic medicine is somewhere, what are the quality standards of homeopathic drugs that is mentioned somewhere else. Then um, the regulation of the sale, uh, regulation of the manufacturing, then the regulation of the import of homeopathic. So they are stacked. So there is a need to have all the things at one place. Now, Government of India is thinking to have a new Act for controlling drugs, for the control of drugs and cosmetics and medical devices. A process has started and uh, we are thinking, and I'm also of the view that there has to be a separate chapter for homeopathy drugs. Why? This I will discuss later. Uh, then uh, these provisions, regulatory provisions in the Act and the rules, they are related to manufacturing, sale, quality control, and import of homeopathic medicines. And apart from that, somewhere it is also mentioned the new homeopathic medicines. 
Now that definition of new homeopathic medicine, which is given in our act or in the rules, that is very restrictive definition. Someone yesterday, I think Dr. Shah was speaking to me, uh, that uh, what to do about new discovery, where that product will fit into. Presently, it is not there. Our definition of new medicine, new homeopathic medicine, says that the homeopathic medicine which is not mentioned in the pharmacopoeia means those ph pharmacopoeias which are mentioned in our act. So only four pharmacopoeias. Homeopathic pharmacopoeia of India, German pharmacopoeia of India, uh, German pharmacopoeia, homeopathic pharmacopoeia, US homeopathic pharmacopoeia, or the French, French homeopathic pharmacopoeia, or UK, UK also. So it means if any homeopathic drug which is mentioned in some other authoritative book homeopathy. And unfortunately, we don't have the list of authoritative books of homeopathy in the Drugs and Cosmetic Act. Whereas for Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani, we have a schedule where authoritative books of Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani are mentioned. So this is, I think it needs to be added. So that will give a, a broad uh, uh, scope for inclusion of more and more homeopathic medicines in the pharmacopoeia and even for uh, research and development. Now, GMPs are prescribed, and G, uh, these GMPs for homeopathic are entirely different what we have for Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani, and the chemical drugs. And another interesting thing is that in spite of huge infrastructure of homeopathy in the country, we have more than 400 licensed drug manufacturers of homeopathy. We have around 200 homeopathy colleges. We have more than 200,000 licensed practitioners, registered practitioners. Now, the representation of the homeopathic experts in the policy making body, that is the Drug Technical Advisory Board, it is nil. It is only a small committee under the board where the homeopathic experts, they discuss the issues, they bring up the issues before the government, and then it is taken further. So, I fully agree what uh, Dr. Honda said in the morning that there has to be a separate chapter for homeopathic drugs, a regulatory chapter for homeopathic drugs, and that chapter should be administered by the homeopathy experts only. It cannot be left to the hands of the, uh, the medical fraternity, unless the medical fraternity itself is a homeopathy expert. And there are multiple issues of enforcement of the legal provisions. Presently, there is no structure at the central level. We don't have any structure. Only the central government, the Ministry of Aish as a part of the central government, is responsible to make rules, to amend the rules, to make the act, and to amend the act. But the enforcement of the legal provisions related to homeopathy, it is totally in the hands of the provincial governments. And if you see the, uh, the infrastructure, the regulatory infrastructure uh, in the uh, states, it is very, very weak. Means those who are responsible to reg ho uh, regulate homeopathic medicines, they are not homeopathy experts. They do not know even ABC of homeopathy. So dilemma, I think it, it is a bliss for homeopathy, but for the regulatory it is a dilemma. Homeopathic medicines, they are very diverse in nature and effects from other kinds of drugs. They are totally different. They are not comparable to the pharmaceutical products. They are not comparable to the traditional medicinal products, whether it is Ayurveda products, Siddha products, or uh, any other herbal product. They are not comparable by nature and by effects. And yesterday, I think someone was telling, I think Dr. Alok Parikh, I think uh, he used the word nanomedicine. I fully agree with that. So I, I am using the word micromedicine or the subtle medicine. If it is micro, if it is subtle, or if it is nano, then the detectability is the great issue. Detectability. Once the products come in the market, so whether that product has undergone all those things which are mentioned in the homeopathic principles, how to find out that? This is the question. We were discussing during the D time uh, before the, this session uh, that uh, the bioactive substance. The homeopathic medicine as a whole is a bioactive substance. 
So that as a whole has to be detected. It cannot be fragmented. Then the scientific validation studies are not sufficient to satisfy the regulatory requirements of safety, efficacy, and quality. And the challenge is really of quality assurance. When I say quality assurance, means from the perspective of the manufacturer. Quality control from the perspective of the regulator. Dr. Katosh, could you just, come to just, your just, conclusion? Just. So these are the six M which needs to be taken into consideration for the quality of medicines, the materials, the methods, uh, the machines, the manpower monitoring, and at the manufacturing site level, the management of the manufacturing site. So all these things are important. So the suggestive strategic actions, uh, since I told that I am working in the government and many representations, many letters uh, related to the homeopathic does they come to me. And there are different groups. But for the cause of homeopathy, for the cause of development of homeopathic drugs, for the promotion of homeopathic drugs, so whenever you come to the government, come with one voice, one harmonized voice for addressing regulatory issues. This is not happening. Resolving perceptional difference about the definition and classification. Now there is only one definition. Yesterday, Dr. Ishwadas told that there is homeopathic medicinal product. So if it is a different category that has to come into the classification of homeopathic drugs. Then the new drug. What is new homeopathic drugs? Listing authority books of homeopathy, this is also one of the uh, issues. Then the standardization of raw materials, intermediaries, excipients, processes, finished products, stability, shelf life. Developing a standard format for systematic documentation of safety, efficacy, and quality aspects. So that once that a standard format is there, and uh, the manufacturer goes to the regulator with that format, I think uh, the chances of a re rejection will be less. And the pharmacopoeia has to be revisited, homeopathic pharmacopoeia. The process started long back in 1962. I think now after 30, 40 years, there is a need to revisit pharmacopoeia. And, the point which was discussed regarding the essay, inclusion of essay, that is also important. The labeling format. So whether you need the indications to be put on the level of the homeopathic medicine or not. So with or without indication, this is also important. And the evolving testing protocols and quality assessment parameters. Defining spurious misprodined and adulterated medicines of homeopathy. Projecting consumer information. This is very, very important. Projecting consumer information of medicines for safe and rational use. If you see the WHO strategy for traditional medicine and homeopathy, the four uh, the components are safety, efficacy, quality, the policy, then the rational use. I think rational use, this is the biggest issue. And above all, we must have harmonized approaches for manufacturing, validation, regulation, adoption of emerging trends of quality control of homeopathic medicines. And another, there is a big question. In India, when we have so much homeopathic infrastructure, do we need a separate regulator for homeopathy or should it be a combined regulator? Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, um, I kindly ask that we have a change here on the board. Please, for the next session, the two chairs, sorry, the two chairs should come and the, the people giving the talk should come as well, so we just change. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas Bedcrose and uh, Dr. D. S. Lohar for changing, uh, chairing this session.